Are you taking AP Microeconomics from Marco Learning and from the Map Store, which he bought that map? We are going to be going over in tonight's session some of the key last second things to review. Um, I encourage those of you who are cramming, who are watching this at the last second, say hello to us in the comments. Um, go to bed. Um, don't try to, to jam too much into your head. Focus on the key issues. And if you haven't yet subscribed to our channel, go ahead and press that subscribe button and let us know how we can help. A couple of things I'm adding into the description, Ian, for everyone tonight. We have an ultimate guide to the 2021 digital AP exams. Breaks down all the most recent updates, tells you guys how to get ready. If you're, if you're taking a digital AP exam, watching the recording of this, check that out. Also a general article breaking down all the things we know about this. And remember on our channel, we have more than 300 videos for all these different subjects. Ian did a review with us for AP Macroeconomics. That's there. You can use that material to help you as well as earlier reviews we did for macro and micro. So Ian, what are we going to cover before we get to our Kahoot game, before we get into um, the, the full session? First, that map was in a book room and it was going to be thrown out. And well, look no at that. Way. Very efficient of you. I win. So um, I'm going to cover some of the highlights. The two biggest portions of the micro exam or the two biggest concepts are market, market structures and market forces. Well, mar in, the, in the opposite order. So supply, demand, equilibrium, and then the different types of markets in which we operate that determine the price of the, the goods and services that we're looking at. So there's no way in the limited time we have tonight that I would be able to do every single graph in micro. But I figured if you've got to know something, where is the most amount of content going to be on that exam? It'll be in market forces, supply and demand, and market structures. So I will do a run through of that stuff, brief, brief run through, answer questions. As the other night, you stop me if there's questions in the chat. And then um, we've got a 25 question Kahoot which, you know, we'll keep an eye on the clock and try to get that started by about 8.25. Great. So everyone, again, post your questions there in the chat. Ian, I'm going to turn it over to you to share your screen and sure. guide us through how we can cram for AP Micro. Awesome. All right. You see that? Yep. All right. I'm moving around things, trying to hit the, there we go. Okay, so today is May 11th. Some of you are gonna be taking the microeconomics exam very soon. Um, listing some of the main ideas that we're gonna cover briefly tonight. First thing, when we're talking about market forces, we're talking about supply and demand, we'll start with demand. We could talk about the individual demand schedule or a market demand schedule. But the basic concept, if you think, how many pieces of pizza would you eat at each or would you buy at each price? And if we're holding things the same, like your income, the amount of money in your pocket and the price of other things you might rather have than pizza, then we've set a demand schedule. And then if the price is going up or down, that'll affect how many pieces of pizza you would want to buy. $5, maybe you'd only want to buy one. <laughs> $4, maybe you'd want to buy two, and so forth, down the demand curve. This is the law of demand. And the law of demand is, hey, price down, quantity demanded is up. Now, students get quantity demanded and demand mixed up all the time. And quantity demanded is moving down the line. And they think that that's technically up because we're moving down into the right. Now, I included a note here about an individual versus the market. The market demand would be like taking your individual demand schedule and compiling it all together with everybody else in that market for pizza at those prices. So you could figure out, well, how many pieces would people in the entire market buy or slices would people in the entire market buy at $5 per slice? And it would probably follow the same general law. I, I would hope so, right? Uh, two big things that explain this downward sloping demand curve, the income effect and the substitution effect. The income effect explains it because if the price goes down per slice, you have more, your income stretches further. You didn't actually earn more money, but you have more buying power. The second thing is the substitution effect. If the price goes down, you will buy more pizza and less of something else. Holding the price of say hamburgers the same, you're gonna buy more slices of pizza. The other portion of supply and demand then is supply. 
and the law of supply at a higher price, the quantity supplied in the market increases. So if, if there's a higher price of, you know, how many would you sell? Well, you've got to be able to get the ingredients together in order to sell and to produce and then sell that pizza. You might be more incentivized if people were willing to pay $5 per slice. So you would produce more slices and so would other people in the market. When these two bits come together, you have supply and demand. And think of equilibrium, that, 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 that perfect point in the middle. It's kind of like the market clearing price and quantity. And if the price goes above equilibrium, then think of equilibrium also as like a magnet <laughs> that is going to, if people are trying to sell it at P2 on this graph, but the real equilibrium price is P1, well, you're going to have a surplus. Too many are going to be supplied at that price. And they're eventually going to have to bring the price down and bring it back down towards equilibrium. If the price is too low, you would have a shortage. People would snap up those items for a really low price and equilibrium would actually act again as a magnet and bring the price back up because people with the shortage, if you wanted to get one of these things, you would have to be willing to pay more money to get it. And so equilibrium is a force that works all by itself. So economists love it. And this is why they often will, will, will argue for more competition, more free markets, because they are self-regulating and price clearing and serve the greatest number of people and provide the best, the best possible price. Now, another reason economists love equilibrium is because, and it mixes in another way of understanding the supply and demand curves, is because it is it maximizes consumer and producer surplus. Now that term surplus can be also used simultaneously with the term welfare. My textbook that we use uses welfare. <laughs> Other textbooks say surplus. This is one of those econ confusing examples where you see the word surplus here, um, surplus more supplied than demanded, and then surplus here, which means that I bought something and I got it for a price that was lower then I was willing to pay. So I got some consumer surplus or somebody sold something and sold it for more than they were willing to pay. So they got some, or they were willing to sell it for. So they got some producer surplus. And at equilibrium, you're bringing in a maximization of consumer and producer surplus. So this is another argument economists would make for why free markets are good because they also maximize consumer and producer surplus when you allow goods to achieve an equilibrium price and quantity. Now, price controls can also come up in the supply and demand unit with government policies. And that redistributes surplus, a price, a binding price um, floor, as you see in the graph, uh, would say the price has to be at least P2. Well, at P2, there's fewer buyers. The quantity demanded is lower. At P2, there's, there would be, you know, there would in theory be people willing to sell it and they would supply it up into this at this P2 and then Q, this farther Q. And you would actually have the problem of having too much of this thing produced, but no way of getting back down to equilibrium, no way of clearing the, that inventory, no way of bringing prices down. So some of the suppliers would actually gain more surplus. The remaining buyers would get a little less surplus and then you'd have all these transactions that didn't at least legally happen. And there'd be all sorts of deadweight loss in the market, just lost surplus. Similarly, if we have a binding price ceiling, the government says, you're not allowed to sell this for anywhere above P0. <laughs> well, then you're going to have very few people respond to that and supply this item to the market. You're going to have a lower quantity. You're going to have a huge number of people willing to pay for this thing at this price. And therefore, you're going to have a, um, you're going to have a lasting shortage in this market. As a result, the people who are lucky enough to get this good are going to get it at a really killer price, really, really low price. And it's going to redistribute surplus towards those remaining buyers. But there's not going to be that many sellers. And there's going to be a lot of missed opportunities and deadweight loss. Now, demand and supply shifters. This is different from a movement along the line. This is the entire 
curve moving upwards or downwards. And the basic thing that I use is this, this um, acronym of INEPT, right? Income, number of buyers, expectations of future prices, consumer tastes, the price of related goods. These would all cause people to want to buy more of something at all prices, or maybe even less of something at all prices. Look, look no further than um, people buying Purell during the pandemic. Before Purell was, was a, a popular item, no big deal. But then it became an essential item and people were like, yeah, I'm willing to buy that and be willing to pay a lot more than I would have under normal circumstances. Same thing for toilet paper and all sorts of other fun things that we've experienced over the last year together. Um, and, you know, in the future, maybe people will say, eh, maybe I don't need to buy this or that masks one day. And, uh, and, and, and I was not as willing to pay for it at all prices, but we'll see. Similarly with supply, number of sellers, input prices, technology and expectations of future prices could increase the entire supply curve and increases to the right and it decreases to the left. Students get quantity supplied and supply confused all the time. Quantity supplied is moving up and down the supply curve. Supply is moving the entire curve. And then you could have simultaneous concurrent changes in supply and demand. And this is where I have lots of question marks, right? Well, what if they both decrease at the same time? Where would our equilibrium be? Um, what would happen to the price and to the quantity at our new equilibrium? Well, supply moves backwards. That has an upward effect on price. Demand moves backwards. That has a downward effect on price. So one of these equilibrium maybe? Um, if supply moves backwards, that has a backwards movement on quantity. If demand moves backwards, that has a backwards movement on quantity. In these cases, you have quantity has gone down for both of them, but price, they're doing opposite things to the price. And that, that means that that would be indeterminate. Sometimes the answer is, I don't know. I, I don't have enough information. So, so I put together this fun, this fun chart of, hey, well, what happens if this one, if they neither of them move or the same, but this one moves and this one stays the same? You know, and then you could see there's a lot of question marks in here because it all depends um, on which is moving in which way. And sometimes the question will tell you, well, maybe supply moves twice as much as demand or demand moves twice as much as supply. But if you don't know, then you don't know and that's okay. So before we get into market structures, John, are there any questions in the chat? Yes, we've got a question here. I'm just gonna come back to it. Um, <clears throat> and there was a question a minute ago from um, Jake who asked, why does deadweight loss occur in the first place? And then Grant wrote, deadweight loss happens whenever a market is not allocatively efficient with a price floor ceiling, since the market isn't producing the amount desired equilibrium, there is deadweight loss. So what, is that right. right? Yeah. That's great. Well, an allocatively efficient and another terminology that, that you could see used your term is uh, socially optimal. They're used interchangeably and they mean the same thing roughly, right? But they're both good things about markets is that they maximize consumer surplus and consumer welfare and producer surplus and producer welfare, but they're also distributing the goods appropriately, which is allocatively efficient too, right? Um, that the, the price ceilings and price floors disrupt the distribution of goods and they harm people's consumer and producer surplus. So any other questions before I move through some market graphs? No, but I want to encourage everyone, if you have questions, go ahead and post them there in the chat. We're happy to answer them and uh, definitely, um, yeah, but post them in their chat. And if you'd like this video, press that like button. Thanks. Cool. All right. So four points of comparison. This is where I'm going to do a blitz through the three, three of the main market graphs, um, perfectly competitive graphs, monopolistically competitive graphs, and monopoly graphs. And to compare them on these four bases, one, the golden rule, MR equals MC, but does this equal price? Two, is this socially optimal or is there deadweight loss? That would be pretty obvious because it's, it's, it's labeled there. Three, is this firm efficient and production? And four, is this firm capable of making long-run profits? All right, perfect competition in the long-run equilibrium. Well, 
MR equals MC. And it, and it equals average total cost, and therefore they earn zero economic profit in the long run. Um, MR equals MC, and it is equal to price. So my first question of the golden rule, MR equals MC, but does it equal price? Yes, in a perfectly competitive market, the price in the market determines the price for each individual firm. Those firms are price takers. They have to take the price. If something should change in the market on the left, then the firm might make more or produce fewer goods based on the new price. Demand goes up, the firm says, cool, price has gone up, marginal revenue has gone up, and we're gonna produce until MR equals MC. We're gonna follow that golden rule. Now, another question I had is, is there any deadweight loss? And no, in fact, there's no deadweight loss in this unicorn market of perfectly com competitive. So MR equals MC, which equals price. There is no dead weight loss. And also, does this firm, can firms enter this market? Yes, yes, they can. Um, they can enter the market because if a, a, a perfectly competitive firm is making profit, other firms have free entry, they can come right in, produce more of that item and bring the price back down and bring everybody back to this equilibrium that you see. So we have um, one more question is, is it productively efficient? All right, and, and it is. And the way you can tell, I've done my best to draw the line and, and make everything match up, but MR is equal to MC, which equals average total cost. And um, you see that at that point, they're earning zero economic profit, but it's at the lowest point of average total cost. Um, perfectly competitive firms, have to be really competitive, meaning also they, they, they have the lowest average total cost they're producing at the lowest possible productive price. So they are really productively efficient and they're socially efficient, they are allocatively efficient and um, firms can enter freely into this. So John, this is one of the most important <laughs> Uh, market graphs that students have to know and be able to compare to the others, which is why I'm doing that. So tell me if there's questions and I could stop. None yet, but I'll let you know. The complete opposite is monopoly. So does MR equals MC? Uh, do, does MR equal MC? Yes. You could see down here where the orange and purple lines meet, MR equals MC. But do they equal price? And the answer to that is no. The monopoly gets to make its own price. Unlike perfectly competitive graphs, perfectly competitive graph has a side-by-side -side graph because the firm is responding to the market. But monopoly serves the entire market. So there is not side-by-side. -side. They are what's called a price maker. So MR equals MC, and then they go up to the demand curve right here, and this is their price. So as a price maker, and, 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 and pricing something which is above the market optimal, which as I, I have uh, noted here, there in fact is deadweight loss. Typically consumers would like more of this item for a lower price. Is it productively efficient? No, <laughs> monopolies don't operate where they weren't trying to squeeze out productive efficiency, at least not according to our textbook. Some natural monopolies might, which is a good distinction to make. And some of you in the chat are probably putting that in there. Don't worry, I'm ahead of you on that one. But, but where MC equals average total cost is by definition the lowest point of average total cost. This is not where the monopoly is producing because that is not its profit maximizing point. Profit maximizing point is here and then up and they can actually earn profit in the long run because of our other question is, can firms easily enter? And the answer is no. Even though this monopoly is earning profit, firms cannot easily then just hop in and enter this market, okay? Um, there are usually humongous barriers to entry, whether they're technological, legal, just a humongous competitive advantage. And so monopoly has that going in its favor. All right, monopolistic competition in the long run equilibrium. And I think John, this is my final graph. Um, this is kind of like the, the merger of monopoly and monopolistic competition. It has features of both. MR equals MC, yes, they follow the golden rule. 
and then they price up to the average total cost. Sorry. Um, to the demand curve, which happens to, in the long run equilibrium, meet the average total cost curve. Therefore, they earn zero economic profit. There is, in fact, dead weight loss because they are also a price maker. And people will say, why? What is different about monopolistically competitive versus monopoly? They serve the demand specifically for their branded version of something. So this is not the demand for the entire market of an entire thing. It is the demand in the case of say frozen yogurt, in the case of it be the demand for like for like pink berry or the demand for Subway sandwiches at, at the at, at Subway, which clearly does not have a monopoly over all sandwiches in the sandwich market. So there is in fact dead weight loss. They they are a price maker for their own good. They charge higher than what a perfectly competitive price would be. And some people are kind of kept out of the market as a result. Although I don't know if Subway is a good example of that because their, their sandwiches are pretty affordable. But is it productively efficient? According to the textbook, no. They, again, like a monopoly, don't have the impetus to want to produce as many things as possible to bring the, the per unit cost down to its minimum point, which would be, again, where the red and orange lines meet, because doing so would actually decrease their profit or in this case, earn them a loss because right now they're breaking even. So can firms enter? And the, the answer to this one is yes. They actually can enter because monopolistically competitive market is about different brands of a, of, of a good, not about somebody dominating the entire market. As a result, there's all sorts of different firms they can enter and offer their own kind of version of something. As a result of that, you have zero economic profit in this marketplace. The short run uh, monopolistically competitive graph earning a profit looks just like this one. It looks just like the monopoly. But as firms enter, the demand for an individual firm goes down. And in theory, they earn zero economic profit in the long run. So John, I did my blitz, I did my blitz uh, graph comparison and answered those four questions for each one of the graphs. I think now we would have time to do the Kahoot, yes? We do, and real quick, I just wanna acknowledge a couple of questions that just came in in the, in the chat. But Great. while you're doing that, post that in the chat here in um, the Kahoot um, uh, game number or link. Um, and I'll post that and everyone can jump in. I'm gonna play again, I did last time with you. Real quick, we're gonna get the game pin. Um, so go. great. So everyone go to Kahoot. This is Kahoot.it. Um, and you're going to type in that code and I'm just going to grab the link real quick while everyone's getting loaded in. So Kahoot.it and the game pin that we want you guys to join us in is, in fact, let me just do it like this. Pin is, uh, 2504282. So 250. 4282. How many do we have with us tonight, John? Let's see. We've got about 25. So hopefully we can get a bunch of players. I'm going to pin this to the top of the chat and add it to the description of the video. Real quick, I did just want to thank Carson, Jimmy, and Jason for their questions. Some popular examples to go through these real quick while we're waiting for everyone to join. Um, popular examples of monopoly. Monopolies, what would be ones that would could appear on the exam? Oh. Well, they wouldn't ask the students actual like oh. monopolies. That doesn't come up. That'd be too interesting, John. Uh, you know, Google, Google search. That would be good. Um, that 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 probably would come up. Fa Facebook, social media. I mean, right now we're in the age of big tech monopolies, um, and so yeah. But 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 you know, you could also look at utility companies like the cable company, water companies. Like those would be natural monopolies. So um, other questions? Yes, hold on. Yeah, let me just I'm gonna do mine in all caps. Okay, that's me about ready to uh, fail. Real quick, the, um, the other question before we start this game, I'm gonna give people a second to join. Um, Jason, Jimmy has asked for perfect competition graph, a firm making a loss has ATC above MR, correct? For a perfect competition graph, yes. a firm making a loss. There's a, a question loss. about that in here. 
in this okay. in this cahoot. <laughs> okay, well then we won't. Okay, oops, we just gave that's us a fine. free point. No, that's good. And a couple of ones real quick. While we're getting more and more people joining, 15, keep coming in, guys. We're on Kahoot. The pin is 250-4282. Jason asks, has the college board in the past asked where the profit and deadweight loss is in these firms? Sure. Sure. Yeah. Uh, port a battery. If more is produced in a long-run monopoly, as a result, it's in a deficit, question mark? If more what is produced? If more is produced in a long run monopoly as a, okay, that's confusing. I'm going to go on to the next one. Sorry, poor battery. Arvin is asking, what are the differences in the various types of efficiency? And maybe that's something we'll cover in the game as well, or? Uh, well, yeah, we covered that a little earlier. You know, there's productively efficient means that they um, minimize their, their costs. Socially efficient and socially allocative are meaning that everybody who wants one is getting one. Right. So those are the two most likely efficiencies to come up. But productively efficient means that they have reached the minimum of their average total cost. Great. And so what I'm going to do, everyone, I think this is a good time for us to start playing the game. I'm going to hide out in the chat. Good luck, everyone. All right, split split bag here. Um, the correct answer is the triangle. The firm faces a downward sloping demand curve. Um, that's as we mentioned that the, the monopoly is the only, they've served the entire demand for the market. So their demand curve is downward sloping. Perfectly competitive firm, while in the market itself has a downward sloping demand, it has a perfectly elastic demand that they take. The demand for the firm itself is its marginal revenue. So that comes over to the graph. And so it is actually straight across. So the next, the firm's marginal revenue curve is equal to its demand curve. Um, the green one is not correct for the people that answered that because for Monopoly, their marginal revenue curve is downward sloping and, and beneath its demand curve. I guess we started with a hard one. I guess I just told you the, the answer of this. <laughs> Whoops. All right, perfectly competitive firm's demand is perfectly elastic. Its marginal revenue is a straight across line.
All right. If the firm's long run average total cost is increasing as output increases, then they're experiencing a diseconomy of scale. Economy of scale is that it is decreasing as they increase production. So increased production brings you down to that minimum point of average total cost. Um, the other one that three people said, the firm is maximizing efficiency. If you're um, pr more, produ more production leads to higher average total cost, that is actually not um, efficient. All right, a hard one. If demand increases and supply increases, demand increase has an upward uh, effect on price and an upward effect on quantity. Supply increases has an upward effect on price, but a downward effect on, sorry, supply increase has a downward effect on price, but an upward effect on quantity. So they would both move quantity to the right and increase quantity, but they would do different things to price. And since we don't know the magnitude, price is indeterminate. This is a definition one, but there are different portions of the demand curve. The first part portion at the up the top is the elastic portion. The middle is unit elastic and the bottom is perfectly, or sorry, it's inelastic. If price goes up on an inelastic portion of the curve, revenue goes up, price up, revenue up. In the elastic portion, price up, revenue down. Awesome, everybody got that right. Good teachers. Enough people got this right that I think we'll just move on. Cool, we talked about this earlier. Price below equilibrium creates a shortage of the good.
people were really eager to fire that worker and they were right. All right, negative income elasticity is an inferior good. So if the price of your income goes up, then you're gonna buy less of it. Oh boy, mixed bag. All right, so it depends on pie crust strategy. Because see, if you look back at this, if you're Lapizza, Lapizza does not have a dominant strategy. So based on the payoff matrix alone, you'd have to think about what pie crust would do. Pie crust does, looks like they do have a somewhat dominant strategy. If they advertise, depending on what Lapizza does, they could either earn 190 or 390. If they don't advertise, depending on what Lapizza does, they could either earn 180 or 390. So they would want to advertise. And in that case, in that case, Lapizza then would, um, they would choose to not advertise. But if Pie Crust did not advertise, then Lapizza would choose to advertise. So I've heard, heard arguments about this question before. They'd say, well, then Lapizza should not advertise. So it all depends on how they ask the question. But just saying, does Lapizza have a dominant strategy and what should they do? It actually really does depend on what, on what pie crust does. All right, good to know those elasticity definitions, and most people did. John, how are you doing? Are you in the top 10? I'm not doing well here. I'm not doing great, I'm just guessing stuff. I'm overwhelmed, all these words. I don't know how you guys do this stuff. Lots of reading. This one is kind of a hard one, but not for a lot of people here. These guys are gonna do well tomorrow. Um, so, right, the marginal revenue product is the change in total revenue and from the additional unit of input and the word unit could be applied to labor. It could also be applied to capital. So you could be talking about that. It's, it's how much revenue did the next person add? We kind of didn't go over it earlier, but when people fired that worker, they did something really smart. <laughs> they said, look, the revenue that that worker, that fourth worker added, actually was not even equal to the wage we would have been paying that person. And that therefore people that got that one right, unsurprisingly probably got this one right.
Cool. People know their socially optimal point. Just to look back at it, it would be at point B if where marginal costs would equal the firm's demand curve, which for the monopoly is the entire industry. That is an important point to remember. The socially optimal point is where the marginal cost is equal to demand. Earlier, we talked about market structures. This doesn't show very well on this. But if, in this case, the marginal revenue is above average total cost, they are earning a profit. Firms would enter the market because it's perfectly competitive and there's no barriers to entry. I think just eight questions left. All right, so here's a hard one. At point B, actually, when you zoom in, you could see there's a little check mark, um, but it's better if they have a question mark. A firm may or may not produce. One of the rules you need to know for the exam is the minimum point in which a perfectly competitive firm would produce if they're not at least breaking even. At A, they'd be cool because they'd be breaking even, but at B, they may not be cool but they may be okay with it too. They at B are covering their average variable costs, but they're losing all of their fixed costs, right? But um, they might not wanna shut down. They might, they might be cool with just losing all those fixed costs, say they're sunk, whatever. But they might also shut down because you know, they're just barely covering their, their variable costs as is and whatever. But that point B that you see there, where MC equals average variable cost, is the lowest point at which a perfectly competitive firm would even consider producing. And that is where the supply curve for an individual firm um, begins. B and upwards would be where they would be willing to produce in the short run. In the long run, if they're not at least earning A, they're out. They're going to exit the market altogether. Cool. People know their public goods. All right, people know their production, sorry, their circular flow model.
All right, so we need to see something that decreases demand, increase of income, increases it, decrease in the price of labor uh, at a soda factory is a supply issue, increased popularity of, of cupcakes that would increase demand for, for sugar. We're only left with one, and that is the decrease in the price of a substitute good. This is a definition one. So I hope that you all get this right. <laughs> You've all experienced this in life and so you knew the answer. Different rates for the same good. All right, that's amazing. That was a harder one. So I'm really happy people got that right. Two more questions to decide the possible winner. We have two candidates that are really close. I am not one of those candidates while people fill this out these last two real quick. We're gonna be wrapping up. Some of you are asking about the AP English Language Live. That's gonna start in three minutes on this channel um, on a separate link, but uh, yeah, go ahead. We'll wrap up these last couple of questions for our AP micro crew and I'm gonna wish you guys best of luck on your exam. Yay, we talked about this earlier, but achieving equilibrium is uh, maximizes surplus and consumer welfare and producer welfare. Welfare and surplus in that context are synonyms. Final question, and this will decide it. All right, if the, the price being offered in the market was 150, that is below the $3. As a result of it being below the equilibrium price, um, you would have a really high quantity of demand and a really low quantity supply. But eventually, eventually, the, the, the quantity of demand and the quantity supply would have to come back to equilibrium and meet. And therefore the supply would have to increase, quantity supply would have to increase, and quantity demand would have to um, would have to decrease to meet them at equilibrium. So that ends our game. Let's see who won. Yeah, this is super exciting for everyone joining us on this AP Microeconomics Review on John from Marco Learning. We're going to be going live in just one minute on a separate link for AP English Language. Thank you all for joining us tonight. And who won? D. D. What, what face? Congratulations, D. Good luck tomorrow, everybody, on the exam. And thank you so much for joining us.